Good morning, uh, everybody. Thanks for uh, listening to today's podcast, so Transcendental Podcast, uh, with myself, Adrian Boothy, and my colleague, uh, Jerry Miller. Hi, Jerry. Uh, good morning, all. Morning, Adrian. So it's the 2nd of October, 2023. Um, a bit going on uh, with the markets, and certainly um, it's going to be a pretty interesting week uh, later this week with non-farm employment change data, always something that's going to stimulate movement uh, in the financial markets, so the stock markets, the currency markets. Before we get into that, um, can we just have a little bit of context for what's been happening and for the last week? So, Jerry, what, what do we know uh, from last week? What's changed? Uh, what were the big drivers of movement last week? Okay. Uh, yeah. Hi, Adrian. Welcome all. Um, well, it's the 2nd of, uh, of October, I should say. New month, pinch punch and all that stuff. Uh, it was the end of uh, the last trading month on Friday uh, and also the end of the last quarter, Q3 or the third quarter from July uh, through to the end of September. We're now in Q4. Why we had mentioned that there are pressures that that cause the market to be uh, sold off or rally in the run up to a, a quarter or month end. And it was interesting, actually, uh, Adrian, um, the, the press were making quite a bit of it being a loss on the quarter of 3.7% uh, for the S&P. And I sort of looked at that and thought, gosh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's quite interesting. And then the then the Nasdaq, four point one percent loss for the quarter. And and I was sort of reminded of the workshop that we did, the podcast that we did on uh, at the beginning of July. And I remember discussing the extraordinary gains that the market had in the first half of the year. Uh, and yeah. it almost makes what's happened in the last quarter not pale into insignificant because it is it is significant. But just look at what we did in those first six months of the year. The Nasdaq, I thought it was 32%. Someone corrected me in the workshop this morning and said it was um, uh, 36%. But anyway, it was a lot of percent, not 4.1% not pullback. So on the year, the Nasdaq is still up 28%. How about that? Yeah, well, that's still pretty significant, isn't it? I mean, that's, you know, on the backdrop of being down about 33% in 2022. So despite that big rally, we haven't actually taken out those highs, uh, have we, which I think is really interesting. Um, but look, let's let's think about just sort of September. I think statistically, it is one of the weakest months um, from historic uh, stock market performance. Um, so it's probably not a total surprise. Um, but on a quarter down 3.7%, is that is that a major talking point or is that just no, sort of? I, I, I wouldn't have said. It's just interesting to note that, you know, we're in a year where interest rates have continued to rise. Inflation's on the way, but it's not hitting central bank targets. Core inflation, that the inflation that, that removes that um, volatile energy costs and the food price inflation, uh, it's still sticky it's still longer lasting than most central banks and markets expected and i think that's what we're fretting over i think fretting is a good word the market is fretting uh, it's struggling with the fact that the federal reserve when did we meet um, a couple of weeks ago now um said that they are uh, likely to raise rates it's possible that they're going to raise rates again by the end of the year we're only we put a probability factor of about 45% when you look at the um, um, forward rates on um, the CME that you've just got up there. That's it. So if you look at the uh, 13th of December meet, you can see that that when you add up the 37.6 and the 5.9, you're talking about 45%, something like that, just under. Um, and, which and is why would and why would the market be fretting? Why would the what? Why would stocks be fretting? Just so the listeners can just get a bit of context to oh, to that. So what you know? What would the problem be? Well, interest rates are a cost to business. Uh, when you know we've existed in a surreal world of record low interest rates since the great financial crisis, we were just about starting to head out of it. Uh, the, and then the pandemic came along in March 20. Uh, and we've had stupidly low interest rates that is just not normal. And I think what's happening, this normalization is something in interest rates, is something that the market is struggling with, partly through hope and desperation, but partly because that's what they think should happen. But actually, central banks like the Federal Reserve are basically saying, no, you know, inflation is stickier than you realize. We are likely to raise rates again before the year end. Oh, and by the way, we're not going to be cutting rates until 
May, uh, sorry, June or July next year. And that, and that's a problem, <clears throat> Adrian. You asked the question why? Is because companies borrow money. There's corporate debt out there. People borrow money to buy houses. People borrow money to buy cars. They borrow money to buy products, sofas. So the interest that they're charged on this borrowed money has a significant effect on what, how people behave and how companies behave. With interest rates going up, it increases the burden on companies and they're less likely to make a profit because it hits the bottom line. And actually less likely to make sales because of um, for what it's doing to the consumer. But I suppose also, um, you know, so what, what's the, the issue for companies is, well, twofold. One, it's costing them more for the borrowing it already has. But because mm -hmm. it's going to cost more for additional borrowing, they're less likely to make additional borrowing, which means they're less likely to put, I guess, expansion plans or growth plans in place. So they may be less likely to hit their longer term forecast than they might have done otherwise. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's there is the other side of the argument. You you don't have those uh, uh, that inability to raise prices anymore. So when inflation was at rock bottom, it meant that companies were unable to raise prices. If they couldn't raise prices, it was also difficult to plan and invest in uh, expanding the business. But there's, there's, there's a happy medium. And obviously, we went from a, a, an unhappy low inflation rate to a, an unpleasantly high inflation rate, which is moderating. But I think the markets are now realizing that this higher for longer phrase that central banks use higher for, will remain high or elevated for longer it implies that for longer but then they'll come down there always there's that but with it and i think the markets are realizing that this could stay elevated for quite a lot longer and anything can happen in the next six to nine months there could be another in uh, intensification of the russian war in ukraine you just don't no, Adrian. And yeah. you could see further price pressures rise. And I, I just not hope, super bullish that we're going to see interest rates fall back much low, but below sort of, I don't know, three or four percent, maybe maximum. I think it, and that's very optimistic. I think it's more likely that interest rates will settle back to sort of between four and five percent in the developed world. So I think one theme I've definitely picked up over the last you know few months doing these podcasts and sort of researching this you know as we do uh, is that the, the the central banks seem to be you know that they seem to be more talking about you know raising rates a lot more than the market was pricing in. I think the markets were more nah it'll be more transitory than that. The, the inflation will be coming down by then. It'll be okay by then. But actually it hasn't been, and perhaps it's now a case that the markets are suddenly thinking. Or the participants in the market thinking, actually, yeah, I think you might be right. I think they were right all along. <laughs> and it's it, it's an interesting one, I think. Yeah, I mean, remember the central banks like the Federal Reserve, their rate setting committee, the FOMC, there's a lot of wise old shoulders there, you know, and I've been around long enough to know, you know, interest rates of 15%, mortgage rates of 15%. I remember being offered a 12 year fixed rate, sorry, a five year fixed rate mortgage. At 12 percent and thinking it was a good deal yeah. um you know this is part of the process of norm it's the normalization of monetary policy and i think it it's been accompanied by a sharp jolt because inflation was rising before the ukraine war age and that's what we've got to remember what the war in ukraine did was just supercharge it and i think central bankers had made a policy error anyway by assuming that the jump in inflation or the rise in inflation would be transitory. Why would it be? Why? You know, and I think we've got a lot of, we've got to look at ourselves. Central bankers have got to look at ourselves. And I think we'll be ruining the day that we provided so much support in the form of QE um, and negative interest rates. There's bound to go down in history as one of the biggest policy mistakes ever. Now, you might say, well, Jerry, at the time that was designed to stop the whole you know, econ economic sort of cycle, uh, the, the economists from blowing up. But actually, it was quite extreme. And, you know, the Federal Reserve was still persisting with QE back until March 21. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing, was, isn't it? And we started raising rates in, in November 20. Um, OK, so this is obviously having a bit of an impact on the markets. What are we seeing then? We've looked at some of the indices. They definitely picked up or 
in the latter part of uh, the week, didn't they? And I think, you know, some of the indices were down sort of 1% or so on the week. NASDAQ probably, you know, the strongest performer on the main indices we look at. But what about the, the, the currencies? What about the dollar? Uh, well, this again uh, is a function of interest views on interest rates. And one of the things that's reflected in bond yields, and you, we saw bond yields um, in the US, for example, uh, hitting, uh, what was it, a 14-year high? Um, and, and that affects currencies and it affects the dollar. Uh, the outlook for the interest rates in the US is nothing like as rosy as it was uh, a few months ago. And that's underpinned this rally in the dollar that we've seen since, um, was it mid-July? Um, yeah, I mean, we look at the euro here and you can see how much the euro has fallen against the dollar. So it's always... You know, if you're brand new to trading, you think, well, hang on a second, we're talking about the dollar rallying, and yet we're talking about a chart going down. But of course, it's it's the value of the euro going down against the US dollar. So the dollar's going up versus the the euro. So it's probably a little bit easier to look against. When the dollar is listed first, like dollar CAD, dollar Swiss, dollar yen, then it's a little bit easier to see that the dollar is rising. Um, so, so particularly if you're brand new to, to trading, that is. But you can see it there, can't you? Sort of big moves uh, that we're seeing. Yeah, yeah, um, and, and 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 I think um, this is something that the market has struggled with, and it's rather begrudging. And you look at gold. I mean, gold had an awful week uh, last week. It fell. Look at it falling yeah. again today. Look at it absolutely collapsing again. Well, yesterday, uh, last week's fall, seventy seven, seventy six dollars. I worked out, which is just under four percent, and actually, it's the biggest weekly fall in fifteen fifteen months. Uh, and wow. I was and I was looking at gold, and it start it didn't start last week. It started the previous Friday, and I was sort of looking at it, thinking, "Gosh, why is gold holding up so well when the dollar is rallying?" Because normally, when the dollar rallies, dollar-based commodities fall. That's how it works. Yeah. But yeah. gold was holding on really well. And I thought, oh, maybe there's something new. Maybe the central banks are buying gold again. Well, normal service was definitely resumed last week um, with gold being absolutely smashed by a wave of selling. Uh, and, and obviously, stop losses run into stop losses. And a lot of uh, funds have just bailed out completely. The speculative um, element as well was long in hope, nothing else. But we've taken out all those lows now. So it's very much a, a lower high and a lower low. And then yeah. it just looks like that we're, we, we could well head uh, down to that $1,800 level as well. Um, yeah, I mean, the last level of support back from March, you know, you're looking at sort of 18, 15 sort of level, uh, a couple of pivot points there. But what's interesting, I mean, Jerry, you mentioned earlier, just to explain something to listeners, you talk about stop losses going off. One of the things that a lot of traders will do uh, is they'll look at a recent low and then they'll start to set you know, stop losses below those sorts of levels. So as the price then starts to take that out, you know, what happens is that stop loss orders will be activated. So people that are long expecting prices to rise or hoping for prices to rise, as the price then hits those stop losses, what happens is that that activates a sell order. Because if you're long, if you own gold, and then you're looking to then close that, well, there'll be, you'll be then selling it to close. So if you then get suddenly a rush of sell orders coming in, particularly where there aren't that many buyers in, in the market for gold at the moment. Effectively, the sellers have to chase lower and lower prices in order to find a buyer that wants to pick it up. And that's why you can then end up with a bit of free fall. And hence here, why the bigger candlestick you see here, as it break through the, broke through the lows from, from, from August, a real sort of speed come in as a lot of those um, mm. uh, buyers would have been bailing out very quickly. Uh, of, uh, you know, and, and, and a lot of big um, big funds, hedge funds, have been accumulating gold on the back of the well-discussed uh, um, report that central banks that were keen to see a de-dollarization of the US, uh, of the global economy, were actually accumulating gold. Um, anyway, um, that story is clearly not happening now. Uh, gold is a very tricky commodity or, or instrument to own because unlike bonds unlike shares you don't get a dividend or, or a coupon you get nothing in return all you do is get a headache you have to insure it if you put it in a okay if you haven't got so much you can leave it at home but you've got to secure it you've got to have some way of protecting it um, so insurance warehousing costs 
uh, and then the cost of financing it and that's the thing that's really broken gold because the the competing force to uh, gold is just putting on the pot your money on deposit and as interest rates go up the cost of that financing is going up and it the opportunity cost for holding gold goes up and up and up i'm not surprised gold's come off i've never been a big fan but um, it's funny how it's decided to do it over the last sort of six six, six days yeah Good. Okay. So um, that's kind of what we know. That's the context of what's sort of happening in the markets. And what it's doing is it's creating movement. And we're seeing a lot of markets which are showing some really strong trends uh, or trend um, changes, if you like. You looked at the likes of, say, pound CAD, just as, a, just as an example. You're seeing here that, you know, back a month ago, it was an uptrend on the weekly, uptrend on the monthly. You see the arrows from the left-hand side of the chart. But now really strong continued move down. And, and now suddenly you're seeing the arrows flipping. The weekly trend is now down. The monthly trend is now down. So you're seeing sort of contra trend, little corrections coming through. And of course, that, what that means for us as traders is where these are the higher risk moves that we're seeing coming against those longer term trends. Now, the new trends, what we're really looking for is to see what's going to happen next. You know, is the market have a little correction? And then are we going to start to have another wave down a little bit like the gold and then possibly be interested in the markets then breaking down to new lows as i said exactly like that gold chart so we'll see but look there's going to be one or two catalysts uh, for some of these things so let's have a look at what we don't know yet so we've got a couple of things this week uh jerry that we i think it'd be well worth having a look at so let's just have a look at the calendar um what do we need to be uh, considering uh for this this week what are the what are the headlines Okay, well, the, the, the key one is the release of the US employment data or unemployment data. It's called non-farm uh, employment. Um, it, it rather curiously entitled, um, but it basically, uh, they, the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the States, they remove the farming sector because it's very seasonal, um, as you, you'd expect. Um, and so they, they try to smooth it out and have something that does not include the farming sector, which they know does employ a lot of people, but it's very, very, very seasonal. So um, this is something that the market looks at closely. And the reason why is not because it it also is a good marker of um, how the economy is doing, but it's something that the Federal Reserve, the US central bank, has to watch because unlike other central banks, the Federal Reserve actually has two mandates. One is to maintain price stability, brackets, that's inflation. Um, and also to foster full employment. I mean, the definition definition of full employment is, is curious because you can't have everyone with a job. You've got to have people without a job looking for other employment. So there's a natural unemployment rate, and I think we probably were close to it at three and a half percent. Anyway, that's what's coming out on Friday, and that's what we're, is the focus of attention uh, for us this week. Um, and we're looking at the number of new jobs, 168,000, the average hourly earnings. Are people earning more? Is it inflationary? So a plus 0.3%, same as, uh, actually, no, it was, that would be slightly up on last week. So um, last month, so plus 0.2%. Uh, and the key thing is the headline um, uh, unemployment rate of 3.7%, which curiously jumped from 35 to 3.8% last month. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if that falls back. The unemployment rate, or maybe some months. revisions, Jerry, perhaps, because you, yeah. you often get a revision of the previous month or two, don't you? So yeah, we, we don't tend to get a revision in the unemployment rate, but we definitely get revisions in the actual non-farm employment change. And last month we definitely did, uh, when the uh, previous months were revised significantly uh, lower, which surprised a few people because the headline rate was not as bad as uh, some were expecting. But when you added it all together, you could see that. It wasn't brilliant. But anyway, that sort of plays into the the argument that, you know, the economy is slowing, that the Federal Reserve don't need to raise rates anymore. Um, and that's the conundrum that all central bankers face, because interest rate hikes take up to 15 months to affect the economy. So God knows how the, the central banks know what effects are going to be created by all these these. Uh, hikes in interest rates. Anyway, so that's the key one at the end of the week. And there's a few others during the week. 
Yeah, I mean, we've got the New Zealand um, uh, interest rates uh, on Wednesday, the early hours of Wednesday morning, and then the same thing with uh, Australia on Tuesday morning. So for traders, what do we? how do we adapt to those? What do we do? Well, if you're a swing trader, i.e. you're holding positions overnight for usually maybe a few days, maybe a few weeks. If you're trading related markets when there's an interest rate announcement or non-farm employment change, that's going to be quite worth knowing. So for example, um, so tonight, there's the Reserve Bank of Australia interest rate announcement. Um, do we want to be holding Australian dollar forex positions into uh, tonight? Uh, the risk averse amongst us uh, would say no, uh, and you'd be more in, perhaps more interested in uh, closing those trades out. Why? Because if you think of it this way, the market is more likely to carry on its original pathway until new information comes to light. Well, there's nothing more important to currencies than their interest rate decisions about them. So if the market, if they end up doing something different than leaving rates on hold, uh, which is priced in, could be a dramatic uh, change in direction or extension of direction for the Australian dollar. Similarly, New Zealand dollar uh, related uh, markets there. So New Zealand, New Zealand stock market or potentially you know, the New Zealand dollar itself. And then as we go through to Friday, uh, you really need to be aware of, you know, US stocks uh, in, and obviously dollar currency pairs. So pound against the dollar, euro dollar, dollar yen, those sorts of things. Um, the risk averse amongst you, you know, might want to be looking to close any related positions off as swing traders. As day traders, this is important at 1.30 because it's going to create ripples in the market, which creates movement, which creates opportunity. Do you want to be in a trade bang on at 130 or at you know 129? No, not really. You want to be closing that off because there's about to be potentially a big shock movement that's going to lead to a, that could generate a big spike or gap in the market. Just hold fire for a couple of minutes, sit on your hands for uh, for a few minutes, and then allow the the market to then uh, to then trade the reaction. So trading at 132, 133, 134, those sorts of things are okay, but uh, bang on the number. That can be quite an aggressive and potentially dangerous thing to do. Um, good. Anything else, uh, Jerry? Well, uh, I, I do think it's fascinating that the two other central bank uh, policy announcement this week, because like other central banks, you know, they've got it adds to the whole debate that's happening in the market generally about whether central banks are right to pause or even conclude their tightening cycles. And this is a big debate that's not just to do with the Reserve Bank of Australia and the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. That's just the two releasing this week. But this whole, you know, do uh, are interest rates where they should be? Should they go up further? Have we taken into account the effect of the past interest rate rises? And it's a debate I don't think we'll ever find the answer to. But um, markets love debating, and there's they're starting to come around to the thinking the way that the, the central bankers are thinking, which is which is interesting. Uh, in terms of other stuff. There's nothing much. There's ISM data out today. We've also got um, uh, one of these Chinese golden weeks where the, the whole um, Chinese economy is on holiday this week for what's called National Day. Um, and everyone sits around eating mooncakes, which uh, I'll be honest with you, they're not the tasty of, uh, of foods. I got presented because I've, I've, I've been over there in Hong Kong a few times at this time of year. And... Uh, yeah, you don't want to eat, you don't want to rush to eat those. That's a very much an acquired taste. But uh, so you'll notice that there's a, a, a Chinese bank holiday every day this week. Uh, okay, excellent. Thank you, uh, Jerry. Um, so that that's it really. Um, there's um, there's a few things market-wise that we can have a quick look at. I mean, certainly there are some turning points going around at the moment. Be aware that you know from what I see. Quite a lot of them are sort of contra trend uh, opportunities, so be mindful of that. We've got a current position on the moment with the NASDAQ, uh, so we're really interested in that one at the moment. We'd certainly be looking to close that out ahead of Friday, ahead of that non farm employment change data. But we're nicely up in profit on this one at this point. We're up about sort of 2.2% or so uh, earlier this morning. It's just eased back a little bit from there. Um, but otherwise, it's actually relatively quiet because, as I said, a lot of the opportunities a contra trend or very strong trending moves so we're really in a stage where we're sitting on our hands and we're waiting for uh, the next sort of round of opportunities to come through which I'm very excited for so uh that's it really everybody have a wonderful week uh trading we'll be back with you same time same place uh next week uh and give you more of a recap and again more food for thought uh, for the following week's trading so thanks everybody and bye-bye for now